Well, church, take your Bible, if you would, and open it with me to the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter. We have made our way from Daniel chapter 9. In the 70 weeks of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of great tribulation, to the 19th chapter. And we're in these uh, closing chapters of Revelation that are hallelujah, amen, praise God times for the church. Um, we saw last Sunday in the close of uh, chapter 18, verse chapter 17, was where God pulls down the religious systems of uh, compromise that had been put in place by Antichrist uh, to help on, uh, accomplish His purposes, where at the three and a half year He... Uh, sets himself up to be the object of worship. But chapter 18 was the bringing down of the economic and political system that um, uh, the, the uh, Antichrist had used to control the earth. And we saw God pull all of that down. And in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 18, we read, They threw dust on their head and cried weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. And then verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. And chapter 19, we take up with that very command. Stand with me if you would. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We get down to verse 6. We're going to pause. And if I were pause, <laughs> we're going to read that verse out loud together. There we'll get to verse 6. I'm beginning in verse 1. After these things, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For he is true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who, had, uh, who sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice from heaven from the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. Read verse 6 with me. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Now, Father God, we say hallelujah, and we say amen. God, you are our God. And we're here today to worship You and to receive from You instruction, encouragement, inspiration. Father, to receive clarity, to see life as You would have us see it. To see life as it really is. Not in this doomed and damned earth of fallenness in which it now resides. But against that day when You're coming for Your church. And in that time when You're going to make right every wrong against Your people and against Your own great glorious holy name. So Father, now as we open Your Word together, we open our hearts, we open our minds, and we open our ears to hear and receive all that You have for us. Father, I pray that the Word You speak to our my mind and each of us here would be as precious as jewels. They would not let a single thing fall to the ground. But we would treasure what You say to us. We would lock it up in our hearts and we would keep it. And we would share it as You lead and guide. So Father, we thank You in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated. I got to uh, looking at this chapter, chapter 19. We read the first part. There are four moves, four perspectives in this chapter. Um, the first two are scenes in heaven. The last two are the scenes on earth. We're going to get to that day called the Battle of Armageddon in chapter 19. But the first part is about a wedding. The last part is about a war. Well... It does end up that way sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go there with this or not, but uh, it does. In this chapter, we're going to see these two scenes, these two moves. We're going to see two suppers. <laughs> the marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride's supper. And then we're going to see the bird's supper when the angel calls the vultures and the birds of carnage to come and eat of the flesh of the doomed and damned and destroyed at the Battle of Armageddon. It's a picture that are so contrasting in their perspective that it's hard to articulate the, the, the breadth we're going to cover in a chapter. But this morning as we think about these moves, as we think about these perspectives, we read the first one is that of worship. 
we, we, I, I know you guys hear me say this every once in a while, but I, we, we plan, the worship team plans the music a month ago. We don't sit down. We have no idea where I'm going to be preaching. I didn't sit down and look through and try to plan out so we could match up music and message. We never, listen, we never do that. And on a day like today when it is so unmissably connected, so clearly uh, the names of Jesus, and we're going to be talking about the names written on His vest and on His thigh, the names of Jesus. I see that and I'm just reminded, God, if you could be in the planning of worship, what must you be in the worship of worship? But this first scene is about worship. We call it the Hallelujah chorus four times here. This is the only place in the New Testament the word Hallelujah appears. And you say, Brother Tony, it's Hallelujah. Well, that's the Greek of the Hebrew word Hallelujah. The H is silent, so when the Greek translated it, dropped that the silent H. But Hallelujah and Hallelujah are the same. It means praise to God, praise God, Hallelujah me. And it's a word that's the same in every language. You can go anywhere on the earth. There's not a, any other language that has translated hallelujah. They just say hallelujah. hallelujah. I read uh, about two guys that met up on a, on, a, on a ship. They were crossing the ocean and each go out on the deck. They don't know each other from different countries. But they realize that they recognize that each of them have a Bible in their hand. And they try to communicate and they can't. So one looked at the other and he says, Hallelujah. The other one says, Amen. And they just hugged each other. That's all you got to know. Hallelujah and Amen. You can go anywhere in the world and worship. Amen. And that's what we're getting to do this morning. There, in our text that we read, there's four of, uh, verses to the Hallelujah chorus. I want you to notice real quick. The first one is the Hallelujah of Redemption in verse 1. He said, I heard a voice loud and great. A great multitude in heaven, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Man, the redeemed, what else would we say? God, our greatest reason, our greatest opportunity to bring glory and honor to you, Lord God, is that you are a saving God. From the fall of sin in the garden up until today and on beyond today to this day we're prophetically looking at in Revelation 19, God has and is and has always been about redemption. Redemption. Redeeming a lost, damned, doomed people back to Himself. Redeeming a people who rebelled against Him and disobeyed Him when they had no reason to. There was no need, there was no lacking, there was no pressure of flesh pushing them like we know today. None of that. They were created with the holiness of God Himself. Every need, emotional, spiritual, material, every need met. And just out of sin, out of the opportunity of the heart, they chose to sin against God. We're going to see in a couple of weeks uh, how ugly that picture truly, really is. But the hallelujah of redemption. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he said, we, are, we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. There is no greater glory to God than redemption and salvation. You know, if, if somebody just says, Preacher, I, 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 I'm so grateful to God for saving me. I, I want to give out all the glory I can. How can I give God the greatest glory? Bring as many people to Jesus as you can through the gospel. There's nothing that displays His glory more than the gospel. Think of the glory of God seen that God loved us enough to send His own Son to die for us that He through His redemptive work might redeem us from our sin and make us acceptable and holy before holy God. What a, what a glorious thing redemption is. The second one is a hallelujah of righteousness, of righteous retribution. Look at verse 2 and 3. For true and righteous are His judgments, because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and He has avenged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. We saw that in verse 20 of the last chapter. Again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now we've got to come to grips with this. I, I find people sometimes who are almost embarrassed about the idea of hell. That somehow hell doesn't, it seems uh, beneath God. It doesn't seem like what God will be. Hell is not about the punishment of sinners first. It's about the glory of the holiness of God. Amen. The holiness of God demands. Yeah. It requires sin be judged. And if your sin is on you, you will be, so, you will be judged with your sin. That's why Christ had to come and on the cross the judgment, the wrath of God was poured out on Him for us. That we through Him could see our sin atoned and redeemed. Through these centuries now, God's patience has been greatly confused. 
Many people have said, well, because God has been patient, because these centuries have passed by and nothing's happened, then, then you know, you see, it must just be uh, God's not going to care. No way. <laughs> the crowd before Noah thought that. The crowd since has thought that. But as sure as Christ was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin and died and rose again and ascended to heaven, He's coming back. The angel said to the disciples, that same Jesus you saw leave is coming back. Amen. And in chapter 4, verse 1, we read where He appeared in the air and He calls His bride out and then begins that time called the Great Tribulation where God pulls out of Israel a, rem a remnant of people that David, King, da King David's greatest son Jesus is going to rule and reign over and fulfill every promise to Israel and to David in that millennial kingdom we're going to be looking at in just a few weeks. He is righteous retribution. Every one of us in this room have been done wrong. Somebody's wronged you. Somebody's hurt you. And usually the thing that hurts the most about that is we feel like, oh, they got away with it. And that seems to sting more than the insult itself. But now we see twice within a few verses we're reminded that God is the accurate record keeper of the accounts and every injustice, every sin against His people, God will make right. He will avenge on all abusers the pain of the abused. Well, the third one is the hallelujah of reverence, verse 4 and 5. We kind of talked about this in our men's retreat this week. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen and Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants and those who fear Him, both small and great. Now when we found that when we first met these 24 elders and these living creatures, these living creations, all who represent creation, uh, worshiping, we found that when we first met them, they're worshiping God. This is the last time we're going to hear about them again in Revelation. We've heard about them uh, four or five times now. Every now and then when the scene changed to heaven, there they are worshiping around the throne, leading in worship, uh, bowing down before, uh, before the throne of God. And here we find them again in that place of reverence, worshiping God. And they invite all. Notice it says small and great. Aren't you glad everybody gets to worship? Aren't you glad? Not just the great. All of us. All of us get to worship. Get to bring our praise. It's, it's glorious to Him. It's sweet to Him. It's desired by Him. Everybody's worship is sweet to Him whom we worship. They're found there and He says, who did He say could come? He said, praise our God who? His servants, those who fear Him, both small and great. That word fear talks about a reverence, a reverential awe for who God is and for His holiness. If, you could, if we could get a glimpse today, if we could somehow uh, get a, a conscious manifestation of God's holiness, it might drive us out of our minds. It would be the most overwhelming, powerful, experience we could imagine and there's coming a day when we're going to be equipped for that and we're going to get to be in that place of of actual present worship and praise i believe there's always a part which the finite is held back from the divine we can't know it we can't handle it mortal can can't can't uh and ha handle all of immortality but we're going to be participating and joining in the fourth thing is the hallelujah of rain in verse 6. Is this not the most majestic scene you could imagine? And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as a sound of many waters. Now, how many times have we heard that in Revelation? We've heard that some four or five times. It's over and again. John uses that to describe this, this unbelievable sound, this, this uh, great chorus that comes out. The sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, why? For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. He reigns. You see, there, there's times we, we, we live in these days and we look at life and we look at sin and we look at all this going on and we wring our hands and we think, man, it doesn't look like God's in control. He is. He is. He is. He, he's reigning today. And we say, well, well, why is all this going on? Because there's coming a time when holiness is going to say, that's it, that's enough. And mercy and grace are going to end and judgment is going to begin. But God is not slack as some men concern slackness, but is long-suffering 
not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. There is a purpose in the passing of these days that God sees and that God knows. And when that purpose is complete, I have in my mind there, there is one person out there. There is that last person that's going to be born again that fulfills and makes out. Maybe it's the last eyelash on the bride. <laughs> it's the last one. But that last person is going to be saved. And when that one is saved, God's going to say, that's it. Son, go get your bride. Jesus said in John 14, I'm preparing a place for you. If I prepare, I'm coming again. I'm coming to get you. That's the picture of the Jewish wedding. There's coming a day. That, that may be today. Maybe in this service, that last one that's going to be born again into the kingdom of God is going to be born again. Maybe it's somewhere uh, east or west. Maybe it's somewhere yet to come. But there's coming a day when that day is going to come. Psalm 47, 8, David writes, God reigns over the nation. God sits on His holy throne. We've known it forever. But we're going to see it there. Here they are at this time when finally Babylon has been judged, when the organized evil has been put down and has been destroyed. And God is beginning that reign. It's, it's, it's taking place. The battle of Armageddon is just, just about to happen. And then we're going to go into that uh, thousand year reign of Christ. And then after that, we move through it in just a few verses. And then we go into what we call eternity and what we call heaven in chapters 21 and 22. We're there. We're, we're on the cusp. We're on the brink. We can, we can look off and see the glory of all that it's about as John has shown that. Well, we move from the worship in verses 1-6 through six to the wedding in verses 7-10. through 10. What a glorious, beautiful thing for us as the church. What a, uh, an, an intimacy. I wish I was articulate enough to, to describe. Uh, there, there, is a, there, is, there is more here than we can get our mind around. But notice with me, first of all, in verse 7 and 8, let's talk a moment about the bride. This, ain't, this, this voice says, let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Glad, rejoice, and glory. Why? For His wife has made herself ready. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now there's two things about this bride that we see. We see that she's ready and we see that she's robed. Let's look at it for a minute. This bride, who is this bride? How in the world anybody can miss that? I don't know. You, 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 got, you can't be looking at this and not see that it's the church. All through, all through the New Testament, the Bible says things like in Ephesians 5, it says husbands, look at it. Let me turn there for a minute. Beginning in verse 25. Uh, he says, uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And then there in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's why the marriage of a man and a woman is so edified and glorious to God. It's, it's the closest picture in this life we can have to the bride of Christ, the Christians, His church, and the groom Himself. It says that the bride, He says that she is ready. He says that she has made herself ready. How do we do that? Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. I didn't make myself ready by works or deeds or acts. We're going to see in a moment the robe has something to do with that. But I, the bride made herself ready when through faith and repentance she received Christ as Savior and Lord of our life. I have been made fit. I have been made qualified. I have been made worthy to receive the inheritance of the saints in life by the work the finished work of Jesus on Calvary. Amen. Not works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. By grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. When it says the bride has made herself ready, it's because she humbled herself at the feet of Jesus and by faith and repentance received her and was born again into His precious bride. It says that she was robed in the righteous acts of the saint. Now we've got to pull aside here for a minute. We're not going to rush it. It makes it clear. Some, some translations say the righteousness of the saints. The Greek word itself is the righteous acts of the saints. Well, now, what, what are these righteous acts? What are we talking about? Well, somewhere between Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the last time the church is mentioned, and Revelation 19, where we find the wedding supper of the Lamb, we find the church raptured and we find the church ready and robed. Somewhere between the rapture and the wedding supper is this thing called the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. How do I know that? Because she's already rewarded for the righteous acts 
Okay. Now, faith determines where you spend eternity. <laughs> Write that down. Faith determines where you spend eternity. You'll either be in heaven or hell because you have or because you lack saving faith. How you spend eternity, how you spend eternity is marked and determined by your life. It's not all for one, all one for all. God is a righteous, holy God. He is going to judge with righteous judgment. There are degrees of punishment and there are degrees of reward. How do we know that? Well, the Word of God, of course. We're going to read 2 Corinthians where Paul is just referring to back what he said in 1 Corinthians. But it, it makes sense first because he gives us the name of this event that we're going to be talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this judgment seat, the word judgment is the word bema. If you don't know what that is, if you've ever watched an Olympic ceremony, you've seen one. It's that three uh, stand stand that Olympian stand on. The gold medal stands on the, the top, the highest, and the bronze and the silver. I don't know if they're a little different height or not. I think they are. That's the word that's used. Nobody, listen, nobody is on that thing but what's going to get rewarded. Everybody up here is getting rewarded. Amen. That's why it's great to be up there. If I'm up here, I did good. I did okay. Now, I may not be gold. I may not be silver. I may be bronze. But hey, I'm here. Amen. What he's saying is every Christian is going to be on the Bama. It's going to be a time of reward. Well, wait a minute, it talks about loss. Well, we're going to understand in a moment how there's going to be, could be a sense of loss, but that it's not going to be a loss in the sense of damnation. It's going to be a sense of loss of regret. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote that letter. He said in chapter 3, verse 11 through 15, For no foundation can anyone lay which has been laid, that's Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, straw. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures it will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned it will suffer loss but he himself will be saved as though by fire. Now uh, here's the picture. We've looked at it before. Uh, if uh, we look uh, at uh, the, the, the description of Jesus, we're going to see in a moment, uh, it's going to say again, as it did in chapter 1, that His eyes are as the eyes of fire. Here's the picture. The foundation that we build our life on is Jesus Christ. That's where you spend eternity. We're saved. We're, we're, because of Jesus, He's the foundation of our life. But I'm living my life day by day. The question is, who, am I living it for Him or am I living it for the world, the flesh, and the devil? As I live my life, there's things going into the building of my life. Some things are gold, precious, silver, and precious stone. That are righteous deed run for righteous reasons. The deed and the motivation, all of it goes in to determine what it is. Chuck and I could be standing side by side doing the, the same thing, and Chuck could be getting uh, rewarded for it, and I'm, it's wood, hay, and stubble to me because I'm not doing it. I'm doing it to be seen. I'm doing it to, for some other motivation, for some other reason. The righteous God who knows the heart knows the deed that's being done. Is it gold, silver, and precious stone? But that house called Tony's life is going to be there. And I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ with His fiery gaze is going to look. And what does fire do to wood, hay, and stubble? Burns it up. And I'm going to be able to see this is the edifice of my life. This is what my life could have been if everything was gold, silver, and precious stone. But I'm going to have this life called Tony Roman's life and God Christ is going to look at it and the fire is going to burn away all of that wood, hay, and stubble and what's going to be left is what Holy God says, that is worthy of reward. I'm going to reward you for every one of those righteous acts. Not a one of them are going to waste it. But I'm going to be able to see what could have been. So when you have that thought, I'm going to do something for Jesus, and the motivation comes in, and it's some fleshly motivation, it's some carnal motivation, it's some of those things, just remember, motivation matters. Why I do matters as well as what I do. He deserves from us our worshipful service and our loving ministry of our life. And here we are, the bride in between the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb, those righteous acts of the saints have been given. Think about it. We're stitching our marriage robe today. We're sewing it today. What's it going to be like? How many pearls and jewels is it going to have? 
Is it just going to be kind of plain and the righteous, righteousness of Christ robed us in white and just maybe a jewel here or there? Or to His glory, is it going to be resplendent with beauty and glory? The bride has adorned herself. She's ready and she's robed because of the beam of seat judgment. I want you to notice there at the end of verse 10, he says, I'm sorry, verse 9, uh, he says, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do it. I am your fellow servant and your brethren I have the t- who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, <laughs> Verse 9, he talks about those that are blessed. He talks about the wedding, but he talks about those who are invited. Now listen, the guest doesn't get an invitation to the wedding. She sends them. This, blessed are those who, who are invited. That's not the bride. That's all of the other un, of the redeemed people but weren't redeemed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit since the day of Pentecost called the church. Who might be invited? I, I don't know, but here's some thoughts. I, what, what about Adam and Eve? What about the first parents? God said in the Garden of Eden, He said to Eve, if from you is going to come a son, and his heel is going to bruise the serpent's head. And maybe Adam and Eve are going to be the parents, first parents going to be there and see, here's this greatest son who's come from woman, who's come born of the Virgin Mary. He came through the humanity that was started and created Adam and Eve. And there they see the ultimate glory and glorification of Christ as His church and they're married together. There stands the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through whom Israel came, that God was going to send a Messiah. And there they stand, the great patriarchs of the faith who didn't understand everything, but who walked with God in faith, who believed God and it was accounted unto them for righteousness. And there they are at the wedding and they're watching. And all of Israel saying, through us, through us, Messiah came. Through us, Messiah came. They're going to see the glory of the bride, those born again of the ages who trusted Christ as saving all their life from Pentecost to whenever that last day comes before the rapture of the church. All who are born again and indwelled by the Spirit are a part of the bride. Nobody else a part of that. I think about old John the Baptist. Boy, isn't that great? You remember what John said? He said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy is mine is fulfilled. Jesus, right after that, says of John, John is the greatest of all the Old Testament saints, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why? Because we're the bride. We're the bride. John the Baptist was the last of that Old Testament prophet who came in the ministry of Ezekiel who made straight the way of the Messiah as he walked into Israel. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sword. There's John. There's John. I paved the way. He walked in and he saved him a bride. He called her out. He bought her with His blood. He redeemed her from her sin. He's made her spotless and pure and glorious. And she's His. And He loves her. And I'm a friend of the groom. And I'm here. I'm here. Most weddings, everybody talks about the bride. But this one, it's all about the groom. It's all about the groom. But it does talk about what she was wearing, right? Boy, wasn't her gown beautiful? You bet it was. The righteous acts of the saints. Blessed are those that are called. Blessed are those that are called. These precious guests. Now, if you... If you've ever been at a, at a wedding and seen a social blunder, or uh, you, you know how John felt in verse next, verse ten, uh, one of the great worries of every preacher doing a wedding ceremony is you're going to say something stupid. I heard the preacher that got all excited. It was his first wedding, and he he'd done really good. He was really worried he was going to mess up, and he gets down to the very end, and he says to the to the groom, he says after he says uh, I do, he says it's customary that you cuss the bride. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's customary that you cuss the bride. Well, John has a blunder just about as bad. Verse 10, John said, I just got caught up. Man, I just got the the groom and the bride uh, of which John's a part. John said, I just got so excited. I just had to worship. I just fell down at his feet, that angelic messenger. John says, verse 10, I fell down at his feet to worship. But he said, stop that. Get up. See that you don't do it. 
See that you don't do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. <laughs> what a blunder. <laughs> but we can all appreciate it, can't we? Can you imagine seeing that kind of scene? I'd want to fall down and worship somewhere too. Man. Amen. He says, no. And he makes a statement about prophecy that I don't want us to miss. Look at the very last line of verse 10. He says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, it'd be odd for an angel to use the name Jesus. They don't normally use the name Christ or Lamb. It's the only time an angel uses the name Jesus. But it's the name that Jesus uses most in the Gospels to refer to His humanity. It speaks of the humanity and the redeeming work of, of, of Jesus as He came to redeem us from our sin. And here the angel refers to Him as Jesus, talking about that work of the testimony of Jesus, the testimony of His, of his virgin birth, His sinless life, His vicarious substitutionary death and atonement, and His glorious resurrection, and His glorious ascension, and His soon waiting come. He said that is the sum it's the substance, it's the spirit of prophecy. In the Old Testament, even the word that's translated prophecy, everybody thinks prophecy always meant telling or, or foretelling, telling something before it happened. That is one of the two uses. But it's used as many times to mean tell forth as it does foretell. When God said to one of the prophets, say this, and they said it, that was prophecy. They were telling forth what God had said. He said the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. You find prophecy buffs who uh, it's all about every weird symbolism. It's about every weird description. A dragon and a, uh, a woman riding a beast. And it's all about the symbolisms. And they get all lost and dive in deep to all of that stuff that's, that's just shrouded in uh, stuff we'll, that, that doesn't matter anyway. But prophecy is summed and totaled in the testimony of Jesus. Who He is and what He did. Well, in verse 11 through 16, we get to the warring. The warring. Verse 11 through 13 talk about the arrival of Christ. And I saw heaven open. Now that's the fourth or fifth time we've seen heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes, there it is, were like a flame of fire. And his head was, has many crowns who had his name written that no one knew except him. Now that's one of the names. We've been singing about the names of Jesus. We know that he has many names. There's one name on him that's divine that deity knows. It's, it's beyond the comprehension of mortal. But He's got other names that relate to us that we fully understand and we fully get. Look at what He says. Verse 13, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and His name is called the Word of God. One of the great names. The Logos. The Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God spoke in many times through the prophets, but in these last days has gave His clearest, greatest revelation of who God is and what God's about through His Son Jesus, who communicates, who articulates God. Jesus said, Thomas, have you seen me and not seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There is no greater revelation and manifestation of the Father than Jesus Himself. He says He had a robe that's dipped in blood why? Because He's coming as a warrior. He's coming as warrior king to reign and rule. He's not coming back. His glory is not going to be shrouded like it was when He was born. He had to go on the Mount of Transfiguration and allow the glory to come forth because it was shielded. It was, it was in His human life, in His humanity. But when He comes back, He's not coming back as a baby born in Bethlehem. He's not coming back to be spit upon. He's not coming back to be crucified and mocked and His beard pulled out. He's not coming back that way. He's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And His clothes are stained in blood because He's a warring king and He will battle and He will win. His arrival, He comes forth. His glory is not veiled. Look at verse 14. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, following them on white horses. Notice the word armies is plural. Before we deal with that though, notice what their robe looks like. Clean and white. Why? We ain't doing no fighting. We ain't doing it. We're just there saying, Amen, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. Go team. Get them, get them, Lord. Go. And we're going to see it ain't no battle for Him. He's going to speak in the sword from his mouth, the two edged sword. He's going to speak it. But the blood is going to be bridled deep for 120 miles. Look with me just a minute. The armies, plural. Now, who are these armies? Well, we know there's two. We know there's the angelic armies. 
How do we know that? Well, Jude uh, talks about Enoch, the sixth, the seventh son of Adam, prophesied about and said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all and convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There's the army of the church, the Lord Jesus. We're coming back with him, but there's also another army. There's an the army of the angelic host. In Second King, Elijah woke up one morning and the Syrian army had surrounded him. <laughs> and he was okay, but his servant was greatly troubled. And his servant comes and he says, Elijah, Elijah, wake up. All of the armies, are, man, we're surrounded. And listen to what Elijah prayed. Elijah says, uh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of the horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. We sing about the angelic armies. We got a song that talks about that. Why? Remember what Jesus said when King Herod was talking to him? Jesus said, I've got an army. All I have to do is just, just blink and they'd wipe this planet clean. When they nailed him to the cross, he wasn't there because he was defeated and whooped. He was there because he willingly endured the cross to redeem a sinful people to himself. But when, 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 I love how uh, Max Lucado put it. He's such an artistic uh, writer. He said that at noonday, on the day Jesus, at noonday, the skies were black. It was midnight at noonday. He said, you know why? He, because all the angels got down. They, they just covered and they hovered as close to the cross as they could get. And they were just listening, listening for one whisper from his lips to say, help. And they would have wiped this planet clean. His armies. Not because He needs the help. But because He's the Lord of the host. He's the Lord of the host. He's the Lord of the armies. When, I, when Joshua was leading the armies of Israel and they were about to go into battle, he sees the captain of the host. He's described as the captain of the host. And Joshua sees him and he's concerned. So he comes and he says, Hey, whose side are you on? And the Lord Jesus says, I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to take over. I'm here to take over. And He does. The battle of Armageddon. There in that valley of Megiddo, I've stood there where uh, Mount Carmel, where Elijah fought the prophets of Baal, and you can look off in the valley of Jezreel, and you can see Napoleon, and uh, leaders of history have said it's the most natural battlefield on the earth. Perfect. And there in that place, there in that place in Palestine, these two suppers are going to be called, one the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the other uh, the great supper of the birds of prey. As Christ comes and His armies come with Him. Notice the authority, verse 15 and 16. Out of His mouth goes a sharp, as the word, two-edged sword, that it, with it He should strike the nations, and He Himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He Himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, of, all, of Almighty God. And He has on His robe and on His thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah, it's on His thigh, the... the Related to, to powerful, that powerful muscle. And on His robe, King of kings and Lord of lords. In the name of Jesus, all we need. It's all we need. It's all we need. And out of the sword. Now, the armies have been deceived. We saw the, the, the demons that, that like, look like John described them as frogs come out of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and out of, out of the dragon. And they came and they got the kings of the earth and, and they convinced them, we've been battling each other, we've been fine, but hey, it's time to lay our differences down and we need, to, we need to come together under a common enemy. The Herodians and the Pharisees who hated each other got together to vote on crucifying Christ. You let people hate each other and they come together on the call to fight the cause of Christ and they'll lay down every difference to fight Jesus. It happens every day all over the country. It's happened before. But on that day, they're going to come down and all God's doing is getting them all in one place. All, Jesus ain't got to go to four or five addresses. He's just going to one. The Valley of Megiddo. All the kings of the earth have been drawn and brought in there and He's going to speak. He's going to speak. And it's done. The writer of, of Psalm said in Psalm 45, Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, Almighty One, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. The battle of Armageddon is not going to be a fight. It's going to be the judgment of God on the most blasphemous, rebellious, sinful, wicked, carnal, people of the earth that's ever been gathered together in one place. 
They've taken the mark of the beast. They've blasphemed him. They've gone through every every time every every opportunity they've, they they've spent it. And here they're hoping they've got a chance to fight together collectively that somehow they might have a chance. And it's not. Look at verse 17 through 21, the winning. I call it the winning. What else would you call it? Then he said, I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying, Hey, all you birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And you may eat of the flesh of kings, of captains, of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Look at verse 21. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. There as the armies gather, gather the sky again, begins to grow dark. This time not because the angelic host, they're with him. But the birds of prey have come because they've been invited. There's not a bird on the planet of prey that's been left uninvited and they come. They come. I don't know if this is true. I'm, I'm just telling you. I was told in the last four or five years, I read somewhere that there's been some amazement that buzzards are laying twice as many eggs as they normally do. I don't know what that means. But all I know is this. They're going to eat well. They're going to eat well. The flesh of kings, mighty men, warriors, small and great. Nobody's excluded. But Tony, that sounds so harsh. I've said it a dozen or two times in the last six, seven weeks. Only if you don't understand the holiness of God. Can you see how heaven's rejoicing at this event? Christ, you, they spit on you. They pulled your beard. They mocked you. They put on the crown of thorns and beat it down on your head. They nailed you to a cross and hung you up and you dropped as a thud and hung between heaven and earth as though you belonged to neither. That's what they did to you. That's how they mistreated you. They've blasphemed you. They've rebelled against you. They've fought against your bride. They've cursed her. They've mistreated her. They've done everything in these centuries they can. And finally, the heavenly host see the holiness of God that's been offended day after day after day all these centuries. And finally, they see Him take it in hand and rule and reign. And they say, Hallelujah and Amen. Well, the psalmist says these words and we're going to be done. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed one, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And listen, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord hold them in derision. Then He shall speak to them in His wrath and distress them in His displeasure. He just speaks to them. These kings of the earth, these armies come together as though they're going to have some battle. The psalmist says, Lord of God laughs. Laughs. I spoke you into existence. I spoke you into existence. I spoke the elements that I formed together. I breathed into man's nostril, in that clay. I breathed and I imparted to man, to humanity, what I departed to no other creation. I departed the image of God, the Imago Dei. I breathed into man's nostril and he became a living soul. Not just living like every other living animal. He became a living soul. And what did you do? My highest of creation. That was my highest glory, my greatest glory. Would have been the greatest of my glory. What did you do? You rebelled against me. You sinned against me. The first man born on this planet was a murderer and a liar and an infidel. And all these centuries, God has patiently in His holiness waited with grace and mercy and love. But there's coming a day, this day, when the nations are going to rejoice the people of God are going to rejoice because God is going to take and reign and control. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride of Christ. What a privilege. Something happened to me when I married. It was a few days after I married. A couple of weeks after I married. I stood before the Lord and the church with my bride and I vowed to love her the day I died. I had never known a greater love. About, I don't know, a few weeks maybe later, I was laying in bed one morning, the sun came up through our window, and I'm laying there, and I look over at this blind beauty laying beside me, and I look at her, and the thought hits me. 
I, I, I loved her. I couldn't. Be, I said, I can't believe I married her on that thing I called love three a few weeks ago. The love had so deepened in the bond of what God intended marriage to be. I looked that day. It was the greatest love I'd ever known. But a few weeks later, that seemed so puny compared to what it had become. Now think about it, bride. We are espoused to the Lord Jesus today. He loves us with an everlasting love. But can you imagine what it's going to be when we walk into and we experience the intimacy of what it means when we have become the consummated bride of the Savior and we're His bride. The intimacy, the oneness. We are, we are in Him. In Him we live and move and have our being, Paul right. He said, look, he said, set your eyes, Colossians 3, set your eyes. Well, we're seated in the heavens with Christ. In God's perspective, it's done. We are already, baptism pictures, we are already immersed into the body of Christ. The bride. And there is yet though a coming day, that Jewish espousal where it's not like our engagement. It was, it was a done deal. It was done. The... the the groom would leave with the bride the things she needed to sustain her while he went and got the house ready. He went and got the house ready. He came back. He took her from daddy's house and there was the, the wedding procession to his and they had the wedding supper. The wedding supper was after the wedding. We come to the wedding supper in chapter 19. Why? Because the wedding's already happened. When the church is raptured. We're there. Paul says, I have espoused you to Christ. Every time you lead somebody to Christ and they come into the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, we have that privilege of espousing others. But they become worshipers. They become a part of the bride that He loves. Today, if Revelation chapter 4 happened and the voice in heaven, Christ appeared in the air. It didn't come right. He's going to appear in the air and He's going to call the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we are alive and remain shall be called together in the air to be with the Lord forever. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. We're not looking for a sign. We're listening for a sound. Today, if the bride was taken, would you be gone? Are you a part of the bride? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Now, I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you're a church member. I'm not asking if you've been baptized. There's an appropriate place for that, those things. But what I'm asking is if you've been born again by the Spirit of God. Because that, that is what Jesus died for. Not for us to have outward lives that conform to some look that we think is a, looks good, some moral look, some moral uh, uh, framework that's out there. He died to change the nature, the nature of sinful man, sinful woman. Be born again into His family. Look back just a couple pages, would you? Look to chapter 22 and look at verse 17. They're just, I don't know what, six, eight verses from the end. Three. The Spirit and the bride say come. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? As a church, as a church, we get to say to the loss of every community, every church dotting across the country in every community, every hamlet, every village, everywhere it's at, a big church, a little church, county seat church, country chapel, a little, wherever it is, no matter, every church, the Spirit and the bride get to say, come. What does that mean? We get to say to any and all through the gospel, come, come, come. Won't you come? Paul said, as though I were in Christ, said, I beg you, I plead with you, be reconciled to God. The Spirit and the Bride. The Holy Spirit draws and the Bride gets to give her Amen and her Hallelujah and we get to invite the lost of the earth to come. Today it's the privilege on, part, on behalf of the Savior and on behalf of the Bride to say to you, if you're here, if you're listening to my voice somewhere the way, come. The invitation is to come and be born again and be saved. Today. We know that today came. We know that today happened. This, the, the, these minutes, these moments have been allowed because God is patient. Long serving, the none should perish, but all should come to repentance. We don't know. But Tony, you don't know. I sure don't. I don't. It could be another thousand years. I don't know. But I know this. It doesn't make me any difference. If it's a thousand years, a thousand days, a thousand minutes, a thousand seconds, 
thousand million. Don't make any difference because why? Because if he doesn't come for me, I'm going to him. Either way, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. And I'm in the bride. And I can never be anything else but his bride. Are you saved today? What's it going to be like at the Bema Christian? Today, you're, 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 you're sewing your wedding gown today. Are you putting a lot of pearls? Are you putting a lot of gold, silver, and precious stone on there? I hope you are. But Tony, how would I know? Are you serving the Savior? Well, yeah. Are you doing it for the right reason? Well, I hope so. Well, make sure you are. And as you do, wouldn't it be wonderful to stand and see that up as your life and see the fire gaze of Christ hit it and just a little smoke come off? Just, just one or two little bricks got burnt and that was it and everything else stays. Because I did it out of love. I did it out of worship. I did it out of service to Him who's worthy. And just a little smoke. But there's my life is a testimony to the sincerity and the genuineness of my love for Him. What's it like today? Are you part of the bride? What's your wedding gown looking like? The Spirit and the bride say, come. Don't put it off. Make some decisions today. The decision to trust Christ as Savior and Lord of your life is where it all begins. That's the foundation. You can't do anything else. You can't honor God and, and be a good person and all that stuff and make any difference until you've laid the foundation. That's accepting Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. But if you've made that decision, begin to make some other decisions today that I want to serve. A, a, a born-again Christian who's not serving the Savior is an anomaly. The Bible knows nothing about a, a saved sitting servant. <laughs> it just knows saved serving servants. Where are you serving the Savior? How are you serving the Savior? In what way? What motivation? Why are you doing it? It all matters. Where I spend eternity is settled by my faith. How I spend eternity is impacted by the way I live. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, what do you say? Let's pray about it, could we?